Masters. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today's idea episode, we're going to be talking about how industrial manufacturers can shift from lead generation to demand generation. And I'm excited to have with me today, uh, Chris Roach, who is the CEO at Catalyst Consulting. He's going to break this down for us. So Chris, how are you doing today, my friend? Good. Thanks. Good. Looking forward to talking with you today. Absolutely. Looking forward to learning a lot from you. I've definitely connected to you on LinkedIn. You love the content you put out. We've already talked about it. You have the most uh, awesome background for period for, for your videos. So man, you're, you're crushing it all around, right? But man, give us a baseline lead, lead generation versus demand generation. How do you explain that to people? Yeah. So both of them are effectively two principles of marketing. So the main difference between lead generation and demand generation is kind of explain lead generation first. Think of it as a way to capture contact information. So you're running paid, typically paid social advertisements. So Facebook, LinkedIn, and you're trying to get somebody to submit their contact information to ultimately pass along to your sales team that can eventually then go into a CRM, automated follow-up, sales team reaches out. And it's a way to gather contact information of people who may be in your audience that could potentially turn into a buyer. Now, the issue that you face with that, first of all, over the last 10 years, the significantly rising costs with just running paid social, and therefore the customer acquisition costs has been increasing pretty significantly over paid social. But furthermore, when you're looking at lead gen as an approach, the actual conversion when you break down of somebody submitting contact information and downloading, let's say a white paper or an ebook or attending an online webinar, the actual conversion of that person ever end up being a customer falls somewhere between 0.1 and 0.15%. So when you're looking at those conversion rates, when you apply that to the customer acquisition cost and lead generation cost, the customer acquisition cost goes through the roof. And this is not really being uh, calculated accurately by a lot of companies, especially B2B companies, as well as the fact that it's a very elongated sales cycle because people are entering that sales pipeline very early on. If I'm downloading a white paper, it doesn't necessarily mean that, first of all, I'm even in your target audience, or secondly, that I'm ready to buy a product. And therefore, the sales cycle and the amount of effort that has to be put in by the sales team increases, which is where you see a lot of a lot of companies have that head to head between sales and marketing, you know, marketing isn't deliver good leads, sales isn't closing the opportunities. And therefore, you have this misalignment with the approach that's being done. When you shift to a demand generation approach, the way that demand gen is different, is you're looking at not necessarily gathering the contact information, but rather looking at how you can educate your entire target market at scale. So when we talk about, you know, specifically with manufacturing businesses, if you have a, a target audience of, let's say it's 100,000 businesses who you would like to sell to, who your ideal customer profile, how can you educate those businesses over the period of 6, 12, 18 months with content, content specifically that can be consumed within a newsfeed, within Facebook, within LinkedIn, without ha having to actually leave that platform to the point that when they enter buying mode and when they're looking for a solution, they're actively going going out and trying to find a solution, they are brand aware, they're solution aware, and they can reach out to your team directly. And that's where you have, because of that, you have a smaller sales cycle, you have a smaller sales team that's needed, and your customer acquisition cost can drop significantly. So those are kind of the outlines and kind of very high level of the two approaches and some of the benefits that I find when clients switch from lead gen to demand gen. Yeah. I mean, and it sounds like it's a pretty big shift, but also that's that stat you gave on a lead generation. That's probably, that's a, that's a kick. That's a blow for, for a lot of people when they start thinking through the amount of effort that goes through a lead generation and the actual conversion ratios that we're looking at there. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and it's nuts as well. And, and to be, to be fair, that's a pretty generous conversion as well. I've seen significantly lower and that's where, you know, when I'm talking with uh, a lot, a lot of the, the potential clients that come to me as CEOs or CMOs of, of companies where they, they come because they've, they've listened to a podcast. They like what I'm talking about, but they don't necessarily know how it, well, our business is different. And well, we don't have those conversion rates. And when you break it out in the CRM, nine times out of 10, they do, if not lower. And that's when kind of that light bulb goes off and you're realizing that you may have a $50, you know, uh, lead cost per lead to get somebody to download your white paper on LinkedIn or whatever that, you know, statistic is. But then you're talking about a $5,000, $50,000, you know, customer acquisition cost for a product that may not be profitable then. And that's before you bring in, you know, commission for sales teams, salaries for sales, you know, the other kind of uh, overhead that is associated with lead gen that just never really gets factored into that customer acquisition cost. So that's where, again, having that awareness of 
what lead gen is and then also that there is an alternative and whether that alternative does make sense for your business that's what i'm really uh, why i'm coming on podcasts like this and trying to explain it is to make sure that the awareness of another solution is there Mm -hmm. and when you and, and just go back when you've touched on the demand generation you really talked about the education portion so could you speak a little bit more of that specifically to the manufacturers when you're saying you know educating those 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 potential buyers what are they doing what does that look like yeah, so if you're in a if you're in an industry where your your product or service is you know very well known, it's education around how your product or service is going to be different, how you know your sales process is going to be different, the different value adds that you have. That's the education component. What we're finding is that when we're focusing on video view campaigns that we're running in you know LinkedIn or Facebook, when we can focus on the 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 goal of the paid social to be consumption of that content, not necessarily driving to a landing page, trying to download a white paper, which is what a lot of uh, typical B2B companies are doing. When we can focus on how we can, you know, really focus on the consumption of that content, we're going to see higher engagement rates and ultimately a lower cost to educate your market at scale. For a lot of the clients that I'm working with, they're quite often new businesses within that industry so they're creating a new category and when you're doing that then you have to educate on how that approach how that system how that product or service is different from what's already been doing so with a lot of these you know specifically in manufacturing if you have a very innovative innovative approach to the way that you're accomplishing something and that education isn't there or the awareness that that exists a lot of it can be actually just sharing the education that this is a process that can you know be accomplished this is how we can do it this is how we can scale it from there so there's two different kind of approaches depending on really the brand awareness and just the the category definition that you have. Mm -hmm. So I mean, are you trying to essentially nurture that that potential client along the way with with your solution so that when they do to get into that buying cycle? Because you mentioned it, it very rarely are they in that, but when they are ready mm -hmm. to buy, you want to be you know top of mind from a brand standpoint. So is it is it is a nurturing type? Is that the right word, or is there a better better word for it? No, yeah, nur nurturing is 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 a fine you know word to use for describing that. It, it is nurturing at scale, basically, rather than okay. a lead lead come in and then enter what we call like an email nurturing sequence, which is kind of right. a typical B two B playbook. You know, download a white paper, go into an ebook uh, sequence, email, and then from there, you know, you have your sales re sales team reach out every three months. Rather than having a direct one to one nurturing it's looking at how you can do it at scale so how can you define your audience size up the audience understand where your audience is and then be able to provide content regularly to that audience over the course of three six nine months to the point of when they do enter buying mode they already understand your product or service they understand the team they know how to reach out they understand the pricing point and they're able to just reach out directly and cite where they learned about that you know or your company from Okay, I got you. I, I was thinking definitely more on the B two B side, where where they were, where they're they're going through a gate, and then from there we're nurturing. But you 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 cleared that up for me. Sorry, maybe some of our listeners were there with me, so I'm glad you were able to to unpack that for sure. And for the manufacturers out there, many of them don't have marketing efforts, or it's they're small marketing departments. What do you suggest? How can they start if they want to go to this demand type of 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 a strategy and approach? Wh where do they even begin? I think a lot of it starts off with defining who you sell to and where your audience is naturally and organically today. So for a lot of my clients, LinkedIn is a great platform that we sell on or we leverage for demand generation because my client's audience of who they want to sell to, they're already on there hanging out. They're already on there. They're posting content. They're consuming content. For some other industries, Facebook has been better. Instagram has been better. TikTok is a new channel that we're starting, especially when we're looking for targeting any of the, uh, the you know, younger uh, demographics or up and coming you know, influencers or whatever else. So there's, it's, first of all, it's understanding who your audience is, being able to define that audience if it is specific job titles, if you are looking for, you know, purchasing managers, if you are looking for, you know, very specific demographics within the industry, how you can identify those, be able to size up that audience and understand really what a required budget would be to be able to hit that audience consistently over a longer time period. So the general rule of thumb that I will use when working with clients, and let's say we size up an audience we say right there's a you know 100,000 100,000 businesses that we potentially want to target you know over the course of the next 12 months who would really make sense for our ICP that's who we sell to you know this is really our ideal customer profile there the general rule of thumb that we'll use on some a platform like LinkedIn is you're going to have about a 40% adoption rate so that realistically there's 40,000 businesses that we can approach from there how many 
decision makers do we want to look at? Let's say it's five per company. Right now we have 200,000 individuals that we can target on LinkedIn over a course of a you know six, nine, 12 month period to be able to bring awareness about our product or service. From there, we can figure out the budget and start to really push that content out consistently uh, to the point of that it can then be consumed, looking for early indicators such as are people engaging with it? Are we getting you know direct response on the website? Are we seeing that certain uh, individuals are mentioning that they've seen our videos you know throughout this that buying process? What kind of anecdotal feedback can we get in those early stages before we start to see you know strong opportunities and, and entering the sales pipeline because of those marketing efforts? Mm-hmm. I'm curious for the manufacturers listening too. So if, if I'm sitting down and I, and I want to be able to pull up something tangible to show you know the measurement of the effect. What are we measuring? You went through several things there. Does anything jump to the top of the pile as most important where you can say, yes, this is this correlates to de- to direct you know results, if you will, from the manufacturer? Yeah, most important thing that you're looking for is return on ad spend and sales qualified pipeline. That's always going to be the North Star. You know, how is this channel resulting in closed world opportunities for your sales team? But okay. With a lead gen or even with a demand gen, it's not going to happen in the first three months. It's unlikely that you're going to get, you know, uh, if your average sales cycle is typically six months, in three months, you're not going to have, you know, five deals closed because you started to market on LinkedIn. So it's understanding what your typical sales cycle is. Normally, when I'm working with clients, we're looking at, you know, revenue as the North Star, but what are the early indicators that can really be used to measure success? Because with a lead gen campaign, it's very easy. It's the cost per lead. It's one metric that you can focus on. Uh, you can look across different channels, and from there, you can figure it out with demand gen it's a little bit of a different approach because of the fact that you're not you're not having people enter that buying process or that sales uh, pipeline until they're further along and more qualified and therefore you can't use those same metrics so we're looking for anecdotal things to start with are is the right audience engaging with the content are we seeing high consumptions of videos on linkedin you know what's the completion rate can we see people watching 50 percent of the videos what's the cost of being able to do that and are we seeing people then come back go to the website are we seeing higher uh, engagement on the website lower bounce rates you know longer uh, time periods and average sessions driven from those ads that we're running. So we're looking at really how people are starting to understand the product or service. And then one of the most effective ways that I found is when somebody submits a a request for contact information or they request for a purchase, have a, a field on there that says, you know, how did you hear about us? Just free entry text and then have people be able to cite how they learned about that product or service. And people will go into a lot of detail in that box when they're submitting that. So if you're saying, hey, I saw the interview that you were on with Chris, I saw the podcast episode that you were on, I saw that you did this, this, and this, I saw this video on LinkedIn, people will go into a lot of detail and you'll start to understand how people are understanding and learning about your brand. And that's when you can then attribute that back to those channels. Mm-hmm. I love it. I mean, and the one thing I definitely took away from that, it, it, this is a marathon. This is not, you can't, implement this and expect immediate results. I mean, you definitely need to be in for the long run. And I think sometimes we get, we, we, we miss that. We, we think that if we're just going to go in right now, we're, we should see, if we put the effort in today, we should see the results tomorrow. But you're saying this is a, it's, it's a, a little bit longer runway. Yeah, this is a long-term investment and any marketing is a long-term investment. And that's where, mm-hmm. you know, right now, one of the, the big conversations that I've been having, you know, not only with my own clients, but also with you know, potential clients and, and companies that are coming to me currently is when, we're in a recession right now. The first thing people want to cut is their marketing budget. And I'm having right. a conversation with them and saying, now's actually the best time to invest in your marketing because first of all, cutting your marketing budget today isn't going to affect you in the next six months. It's going to affect you in six to 18 months because of it is it is a lagging effect with marketing. So yes, you're going to save that capital in the next six months, but it's not going to be until six months time that you're going to have a dry pipeline and really have issues with right now, how are we going to generate opportunities? Because of the fact that we are, are in a recession right now, we do have companies who are pulling budgets from marketing. It means the cost of running ads on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, on TikTok, they're falling right now. So if you're in a position where you can actually invest into marketing, knowing that it's going to reap the rewards in 6, 12, 18 months, it's actually a a lot more cost effective to do that today to be able to then reap those rewards in 12 months time. So a lot of the conversations I'm having with companies right now is now's a great opportunity. It's no different than if you invest in quality stocks and you look at stocks and say, right, the stock's on sale right now. And, you know, Mm -hmm. in, in, 
five years, it's going to go up again. The same thing with, you know, investing in your marketing right now. It's more cost effective to do it today because costs are falling and therefore you can get, you know, you can reach further people. You can have a, a better, you know, basically better bang for your buck when it comes to investing in platforms like LinkedIn right now. Right. Now you got it. I'm with you, man. Now you, you sold me. Okay. And we're, we're, we're sitting there with the uh, plant manager. He's looking at his budget. He's got his marketing guy there and th they want to lean in on this. They want to go in on this demand generation, but they also, they need to understand how they're going to serve that target audience the best way and what problem they're trying to solve. So how do you help them through that? So, you know, just figuring out, okay, we know we want to do this demand generation, but you know, understanding this to serve the market the best way. How do we learn what, what is really going to be uh, impact them? I would sit down with your sales team. It's the, it's the, the, the fundamental step that I think most marketers uh, either are afraid to do or just don't think to do. Your okay. sales team is the one that's got to close the deals. They know what your audience wants. They know mm. they, they're having the conversation. So I like to sit down with chief revenue officers, with VPs of sales and understand who are you selling to? Who is your ideal customer? Not who your CEO or your head of marketing thinks your ideal customer is. If you're the head of sales, who's the kind of customer that makes you salivate when they come in through the, you know, the, the demo request from on the website? Who is that truly ideal customer and how do I find them? Where can I find them? Where do they hang out? You can also sit down then and talk with current customers. Why are you using us? Why are you working with us? Why did you come to our business? You know, start to understand from the customer's standpoint as well what really moved the needle for them was it just price was it the fact that was it the customer service was it the location was it the type of services that you offered you know, start to understand a lot of these uh individual levers that you can pull as a marketer and then start to craft a story around that and it's not all going to go into one video it's not like when you run demand gen you produce one video that you're then going to run for nine months you're telling a story with that so i like to start off broader with the first video that we produce or if you have you know different uh podcast episodes like this where you have the CEO talking about why they started the business, starting to be able to start broader and then get more and more specific as you move on based on the feedback that you're getting from your sales team, from your customers, from existing marketing results that you can see kind of from that historical data as well. Right. Uh, absolutely. I, I, I'm with you all the way on that for sure. And, and thinking through the sales team, they definitely have that input, but there's so much to be learned, as you mentioned, from the customers that you're currently doing business with and learn why. You know, why, mm -hmm. why do they choose you? Things like that. Now, I, I'm going to shift it up a little bit on us right now because I've seen, uh, particularly for you, you know, you have the personal brand and I'm curious to get your take on this. You know, you have the companies out there, manufacturers out there, you know, they have, the, they have their brand, the company brand. Then you have the people who work there, the, their personal brand. That could be the salespeople. What works, what doesn't work and, and maybe why. Give us, break, break that down for us because there's a lot of controversy around this right now when you look at company pages and, and company pages versus the people that work for the companies and, and where should they should lean there. Yeah, I think for manufacturing specifically, uh, this is an interesting topic because it's not something that you're seeing a lot of CEOs with a personal brand. You're not seeing mm -hmm. a lot of salespeople go out there. It's more of a an old-fashioned approach to marketing, which really, again, leads into the lead gen and company profiles. The issue is people don't buy from companies, they buy from people. As someone that is looking to, you know, purchase uh, from, uh, you know, five different companies, you become a commodity as a company there. So one of the best ways to differentiate yourself is, do you have a, a you know, some kind of connection with the CEO, with the high up leadership? You know, have you listened to the podcast? Have you engaged with content that they're producing at scale? And do you like that individual, basically? That's what it comes down to. Do I want right. to work with you? One of the, the you know, honestly, the, the most reason, uh, one of the best reasons I'm in business right now is because people like me and want to work with me. There are tons of demand generation agencies out there. There are tons of demand generations agencies that charge more than me, that charge less than me. You know, there are a lot of options, but people come to me because of the approach that I take and because they want to work with Catalyst and they want to work with me and the approach that I have. That all stems from the content that I produce on a regular basis, like coming on podcasts like this, like being able to talk about that. So as a CEO of a manufacturing company, I'd be looking at this as how can I start to produce content that is going to allow my potential buyer to invest in me personally and then ultimately the business. When people start to produce content only on the business profile, first of all, the organic reach is less. So you're looking at basically it's just not going to be as effective. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, people don't want to buy from that business themselves. They want to buy from those, you know, those individuals. So for me, I'm always recommending that clients build up, especially CEOs, build up that personal brand. It doesn't have to be 
at the situation where you're going on a podcast a week or you produce your own podcast a week. It doesn't have to be a higher frequency. Uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of marketing gurus go out there and say, Hey, you know, go and you have to produce three videos a day and post them on TikTok and all this other nonsense. To me, that's total BS. If you're looking at investing in personal branding, you have to do it in a, in a way that is sustainable over six months. And that's kind of the threshold that I'll use with, a, you know, with clients when they're looking at creating their own podcast. What's sustainable for you to do this over a six month time period? Is it one a week? Is it one every two weeks? Is it one a month? Whatever that is, because once you start to do it consistently, you'll see the results. Mm-hmm. Then you'll start to enjoy it. Then you'll get better at it because your first couple of videos, I hate to break it to you, they're going to suck. It's hard to do it. It's, it's really difficult. Like you get better as you go on. And if anybody would go on my TikTok, look at the first couple of videos I produced, look at the quality of the podcast. Like it, it, it goes up over time. So don't yeah. expect to, you know, come out of there with this high quality production and have a, you know, a ton of traction on your first video but look at doing something that is sustainable over a six month period and then invest in it. And then don't worry about any kind of attribution or metrics, just invest for six months and just see what happens, see what the feedback is and almost put your blinders on because you don't want to be trying to attribute revenue and sales back to this straight away. Stop trying to look for results because like you say, it's a marathon, it's a long-term investment. It's no different than any other kind of marketing where if you stop too early, you're going to stop before you really have that compound effect. Once you have the compound effect, that's when it gets interesting. Now, I am curious though, because I mean, you've talked several times about the CEOs and the CEO brand take it down a few levels. Where could it work and where could say, say you're, you're just an employee like myself or, or your, your mid-level management, does the personal brand, could that be impact the company, you know, not at the CEO level? How does that work? Yeah, I think the CEO level is the most effective. So if your okay. CEO is willing to do it, it's the most effective. It doesn't mean it has to be the only one though. Ultimately, when you're the leader of the company and you're the captain of the ship, you know, people want to hear from you. That's why the CEO brand, the founder's brand is so effective. However, one of the big pushes that I'm making with clients, especially with clients that have existing sales teams and the approach and we, we, you know, they understand making that shift from lead gen to demand generation. They want to make that change. The biggest pushback that I get when I meet with the chief revenue officer or head of sales is, Hey, I got five sales guys here and you're telling me you're going to cut down the leads. What do you want me to do with them for the next six months? Because if they're only closing, you know, opportunities that are, you know, going to close at 25% or higher, there's a lot of free time that they have to fill. And I mean, what are they going to do? Outbound sales the entire time? You know, that's not always going to be uh, beneficial for the company. It's not always going to be a good use of time. One of the, the big pushes that I'm making right now is have your sales team invest into their personal brands and reaching out and basically getting into this quote unquote social selling, which is not a term that I particularly like using. I don't think it's the correct terminology for what you're trying to do, but for simplicity, let's call it social selling um, to the point when you as a salesperson, you go and you connect with your target audience on LinkedIn. You start to produce videos, you know, explaining certain elements of your job, certain, you know, feedback that you get from calls. And really you just start to document things that you're doing on a daily basis. What you'll find is to you, it may not seem that important, but your potential buyer, it can really move the needle, start to produce content, start to talk Talk about your family, talk about your career, your aspirations, allow people to buy into you as an individual. And then as a sales leader, when it comes to having that initial sales call, somebody reaches out, the amount of sales calls that I get on where people go, I feel like I know you. I know you're from England. I know you live in Milwaukee. I know you got married three, four years ago. You know, I know all of these individual, you know, things about you. I know you just bought a house before Christmas, you know, all of these things. Right. Where it's like, but again, because people follow the story and they want to learn about it and and they they subconsciously just buy into it and that's something that for me has been very interesting not only as a ceo but ultimately someone as you know i take a lot of the uh, inbound sales requests for catalyst i'm still you know the the individual that people want to talk to when i get on those calls people feel they have some kind of relationship with me even though i've never met them because of the content that i'm producing right it does make a difference i mean i've, I've seen that firsthand you know getting on phone calls getting on zoom meetings with, with potential clients and you know because of eco why you know, they, they, we have a connection. It's a common connection point. So I feel like that's, that's important for sure. And, and you've mentioned too, several times, like your TikTok account and things that you're doing there. So video, video, that's a big thing. And I know manufacturers are looking at that. I have a really good friend, uh, Jeff Long, give him a shout out right here. He's been on Eco Ask Why. He, he really helps with the video and manufacturing. So how are you seeing that change the game, man? What, 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 what's been the biggest, uh, you know, impact there? I think the biggest shift in video is that you don't always have to have the highest quality production 
video to be effective. I think having okay. high quality video production is great for uh, a demo video, for a uh, highlight reel, basically on the website. You right. know where you meet the team. You know, it, it, there is a there is a time and a place for high quality video production. But if you're going to do this consistently. Short it's form. an it's it's an iPhone. It's an iPhone is all right. you need. An iPhone. You need a TikTok account um, or Instagram. I personally, whilst I will produce a lot of content for tick for TikTok, what I'm finding is that that TikTok content is being repurposed back to LinkedIn and performing consistently better than if I just produced a video for LinkedIn. So that really? for me is yeah, that's where I I personally uh, find a lot of value in TikTok. The 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 following I have on TikTok is small. It's, you know, 5% of what I have on LinkedIn. It's not for building up a huge audience on TikTok. It's the fact that when I repurpose those videos, it's the full screen. You see the TikTok stamp. You have the text at the beginning. It's my face on the screen. It's a scroll stopper. And that's where when you're consuming content on mm. LinkedIn, it really stands out because everyone else is, you know, 16, nine videos, text posts. It doesn't jump out off the screen, especially if you're scrolling on your phone as much as a uh, TikTok video will do. Right. And I, and I mean, I'm sure that will probably change over time, but, but for right now, you're seeing that as being the, cause that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get them to stop to pay. To, to, you're just trying to get their attention. So it's curious that that's working for you. Yeah, and, and it will change over time. More people are going to jump on it. It's going to become more normal. I, th- I can see li- LinkedIn eventually moving into uh, almost a, 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 a Reels, kind of Instagram Reels component where mm-hmm. you're just watching videos. I can see LinkedIn going that way, but that just talks to the importance of of how critical video is on LinkedIn or in general of producing video. The fact that Instagram now has Reels, Facebook has uh, Reels and Stories, TikTok is so huge. LinkedIn is, in my opinion, going to go that way and eventually start to you know, have more of a separate video consumption element of especially the mobile application. Um, mm-hmm. And that just talks to the importance of producing video content and how effective it can be. Yeah. Absolutely, man. That's great to know. And it's, I'm so glad you mentioned because that rawness, I feel like so many times, particularly manufacturing, is that you feel like it has to be perfect. And there is a, per, a place and time for that perfect video, but that short term, short, short form reel, there's so much value in that. And just, and also the rawness. I, I find the, the rawness of some of those videos, that's what you know I enjoy the most. And that's where I learn the most. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's more authentic. It, it, it yeah. again, it, it's, I don't want to watch a polished, Instagram or LinkedIn ad because it feels like an ad. It feels like a a, a commercial. I'm not going to engage with that. If it's you with an iPhone, you know, looking at the screen recording out on a walk with your dog in the morning, whatever that is, talking about those, those are, I mean, to me, so I produce those videos. Those are some of the highest engagement videos I've had is me walking around Florida in a tank top, walking the dog, you know, with AirPods in. And that was, you know, content like that has performed consistently better than, you know, very high quality, uh, you know, videos that I'm producing. So again, understanding and, and testing that is going to be key um, as someone that, you know, if you're a CEO of a manufacturing company and you're thinking, right, I, yeah, there's a certain level of professionalism that I want to keep by not, you know, maybe I'm not comfortable enough to be able to, you know, be that casual with it. That's fine. Have right. it in the office, stick a camera on you and just record what's going on and just document things that are going on, you know, on a daily basis. Uh, and you'll find that that content will start to be consumed and start to perform very, very well. I love it. Well, Chris, this has been a, a great, Great insight here. A lot of a lot of uh, actionable takeaways for our for our listeners out there. We do call it Eco S Y because we we wrap up with the why at the end here. So you know, give us that why. You know why is getting crystal clear on those marketing efforts so important to industrial manufacturers? I think, uh, and and I'll say it, it's it's not only important in industrial manufacturers. It's important across everywhere right now because of the yep. fact that we are in this recession at the moment and the immediate response to make when you enter a session is to be very, very protective, very defensive. And the first line item you're going to cut is your marketing spend. And that's going to impact the business significantly in 12 to 18 months time. I know we touched on this a little bit earlier. To me, that's the why right now. Why is investing in the right kind of marketing so critical? We're seeing rising customer acquisition costs. We're seeing opportunities become greater and greater for these businesses on social platforms for you know producing social content. If you're not jumping on it now, in 18 months time, it's going to be a large regret in my opinion. And the next 12 to 18 months are really going to separate who comes out of this recession, accelerating, doing really well and who's thriving and who's barely surviving. Right. Well, Chris, this has been great again. Now, where do you want people to go connect with you, learn more, you know, from, from Catalyst Consulting, we'll just kind of point them in the right direction here. 
yeah, anyone anyone that's interested in connecting with me, you know, LinkedIn is a great uh, channel that I publish a lot of content on. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly on there. If you are looking at, you know, consuming more of this content, you know, on a regular basis, I would say TikTok is kind of like my uh, library of content because you can literally just click on it and go through all the videos. So if you are interested, you know, TikTok is a great way to consume a lot of the videos on there uh, and then head to our website, which is catalystconsulting.services. All right. And we'll, we'll make sure we sync that up in the show notes for you listeners out there. Just go there. You can connect directly with Chris. I love the stuff that you put out there. It's been great to actually be able to get together and do this, Chris. So thank you so much for, for everything you shared with us today on Eco Ask Why. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And that was a lot of great information from Chris. I tell you what, I learned a ton about demand generation. You know, I've done some research on lead generation, demand generation, new topic. And so hopefully that we covered some new, some new ground for, for you all, gave you some new ideas. But at the end of the day, like he said, people buy from people. And let's figure out the best way to serve them, be there, help them along the way, cultivate that relationship. And when they're ready to, to make a purchase, we'll be in a good position to serve them at the highest level. So if you're enjoying Eco Ask Why, give us a rating, two sentences. It makes a big difference in the world. Go check out on the in, in the show notes as well. If you have a war story, we'd love to hear that war story. Send it to us. You can send it, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, the, maybe the funny, the, the things that just happen that nobody's going to believe because we just feel that the industrial world, you know, it, it's special. So let's get out there and let's talk about it. Let's let's share these stories. So again, thank you so much for, for spending your time with us on this podcast today. If you like this one, share it with someone else because there's a lot here in demand generation that Chris unpacked that can really benefit others. So I hope you have a great day. And remember to keep asking why.